ideas to go beyond the form, beyond the class, beyond the shackles of history, beyond the bubbles of complacency. Ten ideas to defrag mind and body. Okay. Well, okay. If, you're, if you're ready, we'll we'll launch. <laughs> we'll launch. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> Here. Yeah. Anyway, let's get on. Let's. Um. Uh, how do you feel about reciting your first first? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, let's do that. I've never done this. I actually haven't read this in front of anybody. So you're the first person. Notes from the Drift, part one. Outcasts, alone in all-night coffee shop contemplation, dream of a free and wild humanity. Rebels of breath in dusty road seclusion hold vigils for a universe without end. Wanderers at home in the back alleys of infinite earth dissolve brickwork boundaries between mind and body. Living irregularities in the plasma of human destiny, we all seek. Seek original rumination. Seek Baudelaire's sense of existence, immensely increased. The ordinary have such grandeur. An, imme an immensity nests in the simple that assaults our mediocrity. Species haunted, tangled in a world roaming daydream. Memories pursue us. The intimate world of our ancestors calls out from living root and bone branch, made so by virtue of itself, immediately sacred. The men and women of old lived as their natures prompted, walked as we hope to, on the edge of everything. Complicated and eurythmic creatures, endowed with genius, suffering and sighing every beautiful ambition, we have such immensity. In flesh, in bone, in blood, the ancient effort of our species to remain barefoot upon this world. advocate of mind body culture a fusion of a writer a fighter poet and author here with me today to talk about his new book notes from the drift a collection of observations anecdotes in which the protagonist the traveler discovers wisdom in the most uncommon of spaces and ultimately finding that the only destination to any journey is not the arrival, but the person you become along the way. Welcome to my series of 10 podcasts, Anthony Gilbert. You got it. <laughs> Thought I'd have a good go. Good go with that. And I got close to it. Thank you. Right. You're so welcome. Um, you're in, thank you for that fantastic introduction, that reading from your book. And it touches on many themes that perhaps we can run through in this short podcast today, but I'd like to start off with uh, perhaps you could introduce something about yourself, uh, your background and a little bit behind the book and how you came to be where you are today. It makes it interesting for people. It's not just a linear journey, but it's, it's literally just pieces out of 30 years of journals. And in that 30 year time span, um, uh, black belted in judo when I was 18, uh, Aikido when I was 26, um, found Tai Chi after a car accident that damaged my back, studied uh, Chen, a little bit of Chen, Wu and Yang style and got into Qigong extensively. Um, Certified as a teacher with uh, Raja Yanka in the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi in California. Um, along the way, traveled, met people, and uh, many other teachers along the way. I'll give a shout out to uh, Jim McRitchie, who just migrated back to the UK from, from New, uh, Long Island, which is now Long Island, from America. Um, Jim's still living over in Liverpool. I think if anyone can uh, spend some time learning his, his method of internal Qigong, it's well worth it. And the journey, I mean, the book is, the book, I have to say, defies even me in terms of explanations. I know what I set out to do, and I'm not sure that I hit my mark, but it created something authentic in the process. Um, 
if you wanted to look at the book, uh, you know, if you really wanted a, a pat answer for what it is, it's you could say it's a Taoist-inspired wanderer's collection of spiritually inspired prose poems. You could say it is uh, anecdotes and allegories from a spiritual life. Um, the notes that created Notes in the Drift are really just my observations of classical Zen and Taoist ideas in an, in an com, you know, contemporary landscape. Um, one of the things I was trying to work out for myself was a simple belief that I have, which is that if something like Taoism, which professes to be universal, is truly universal, it's going to exist in every culture and have an inter, uh, individualistic cultural experience. So what the way yin and yang is understood in China is not going to be the way yin and yang is really understood in America or in England or in Europe. I think every every culture is going to have different expressions of the Tao, as that because every culture is you know painted differently. Every um, they're just expressions of human possibilities. Um, so that's what I was trying to work out. And as I was going through my journals, I just found a thread and followed it. And this is and the book is the product of that thread. Okay. Um what I'd like to do, if I if I can, over the next uh, ten minutes, and obviously this is going to be a very brief introduction to not just yourself but uh, to to your work, is to is to talk about just some of the main themes that come running th that I see through the book, having okay. having read it, and and how we might play around with those without. If as much as possible, avoiding using terms that place us in different camps, you know, and I mm -hmm. think as much as it's 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 interesting that we can define things according to these labels, if we can, and I think that's in this book so strongly, this ability to weave itself between different disciplines and come out with a fresh new language. So, for example. One of those themes that is very much there in the introduction and is seen again and again throughout is this, this idea of changing borders, fluid, the fluidity of edges, um, the constant references to coastal spaces that are permanently undergoing change, this idea of travel and wandering and where possibility of change resides, I suppose. You're living in Colorado, is that right at the moment? Yes. Currently, yep. Yeah. My 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 geography of North America is almost zil. <laughs> but the dead center of the country. It's not known, is it, Colorado, for its coastal waters? No, but I grew up on Long Island, which is in New York, and spent a lot of my time on you know, I'd say the first thirty five years of my life on the East Coast, um, before moving to the West. And I've traveled back and forth across the country a few times. So the waterways and the, the moving edges that you see throughout the piece are both um, from my youth spent on the Atlantic coast to um, waterways, the Mississippi, um, lakes and rivers here in the high Rockies. Um, all of those you know, edges are changing and moving. Some of them are disappearing, unfortunately, but that's a whole probably different podcast. <laughs> and these edges that you describe in, 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 language very much related to shifting processes. Is that something that you were intending to confine to that world or was there another layer here that I'm probably misreading into it whereby we're talking about a much more global shifting going on? Well, I was looking at the transition between, oh, uh, I don't want to say this. So when we practice Tai Chi or Qigong or yoga or any, you know, mind body practice, we start off with an awareness of ourselves being, well, let's say we hope not start off with, but we hope to achieve an awareness of ourselves as a fluid being. What I've done is then looked for that sense of fluidity that I have in my practice in the outside world and made note of it. Um, being a writer, I made note of it in a way that would be pleasing to people. Um, but looking to experience those things that we have in our practices in the world, that's to me is the ultimate expression of our studies. Um, how does fluidity move beyond the form into our awareness of the, the world around us? And I think it, it will probably, to some extent, if you follow it, move it into um, the, the, the natural world, the world that humans have created. Um, clearly, there's a lot of fluidity going on politically in the, in the, in the globe, um, changing borders, changing alliances. 
I don't know that um, oof, I don't know that I'm the right person to speak to any of that, but I'm I'm experiencing it along with everybody else, mm-hmm. and that's what I was trying to get across. Mm-hmm. And maybe in some sense, of rerouting ourselves back to our origins and nature, mm-hmm. you know, as a practice into itself. Mm-hmm. I think that's quite an interesting subject that comes up uh, again so often in the book about this this sense of movement and connection with nature but not in some sort of romantic state in which we were once uh, complete in harmony with the world and the world all lived in wonderful harmony with everyone and we nearly all followed these 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 universal laws and everybody was was happy and fulfilled but in a sense of um, I get from your writings that there is, in the process of movement and travel, there is this unveiling of language that enables us to understand and interpret what's happening around us in the way that movement, we're such a sedentary race at the moment, we're so still that we've lost that sense of, that, that vocabulary, if you like. Is that, what, is, is that partly a, a valid reading of it, or am I just making that up as I'm going along? <laughs> no, I think it's a valid reading of the, of the text. Um, I think to some extent, we did, I don't think life has ever been easy, so I don't believe that there was this romantic, idyllic, utopian time in humanity that the Chinese kind of revert back to as, you know, in, in their prehistory, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see any reference to that. You know, um, mm. uh, my partner's an anthropologist. It's just not in the record. <laughs> you know, it's it's no. not there. But what there is is there. Uh, there are examples of people who lived closer to nature, who live, who are more in harmony with nature. And one of the things that people don't kind of skip over. Well, one of the things that I'd say the whole New Age movement skips over is that being in harmony with nature also means that you are not in charge. Nature is in charge. And nature can be unpredictable, violent at times, um, and you have to learn to move through that. I think it's one of the things that we forget within the martial arts is that combat, which I have not engaged in in quite a long time, (laughs) um, is a reality in the natural world. You know, learning to deal with unexpectedness that hurts, whether it is, um, you know, an opponent or it is uh, a landscape that you have to transverse, or it's just the stresses of normal life. Um, I mean, we live in a, probably the most stressful time in human history. Learning to accept that, yeah, it's gonna be difficult, but I can move through it. Mm-hmm. And that moving through it is also part of the Tao, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not meant, it's not gonna be idyllic and easy, but we can, we've always gotten through it. And I think that's one of the point of the point of the book is this reflection on the idea that we've always moved and to quote a section of the book, we've always softened the edges with our bones. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that idea of movement through things, the, the idea of obstacles and difficulties and um, engaging with them is, 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 again, something that comes up regularly in, in the book. And it's, it's about this wonderful idea that is inherent in aspects I've seen of, of Chinese philosophy, not always Taoism, sometimes it's there in Confucianism and in other Chinese philosophers, but this idea that um, we give out to the world and it's what we give out that, that really matters. It's our, it's our cultivating our interactions with others is what's important and that we, mm-hmm. can, can, we can do that on a, on a constant basis. It's not something that we have to wait until we're enlightened beings in order to be able to do it but it can be done on a regular daily basis you know just interacting in a meaningful way with people and through that process inching something forward you know you know in politically on the on the left we always talk about accomplishing very grand schemes of things and we very much don't talk about what we can do uh, on a very personal basis with each other in, in that way and uh, this book, I think, is is great in the way that it talks about finding purpose in the ordinary, of which we tend to skip over. We do, we do. We, we, I mean, we're our cultures are driven a lot by entertainment, and our cultures tend to be driven a lot by uh, satisfaction. And one of the things that and, and that that creates is a sense that we have to take in to be satisfied. And I've always held the belief, and I, I don't remember if I got it from a teacher or if I just kind of fell upon it myself, but um, it's what I give to the world that lasts. I had a very, I remember a very disturbing conversation with a very 
early girlfriend who turned around and I was trying to explain to her, I have no way of actually perceiving your love for me. You know, everything, I mean, I'm looking at it through my lens, you're looking at it through your lens, and we're not really ever going to be on the same page because we've never had the same experiences. And then you can get into the whole idea that physiologically we process information differently. So what, what can I be sure of? And what I kind of came to was the only thing I can ever be sure of is what I create, what I put into the world. If I love somebody and I, I give them my love, I'm sure of my love. If I create compassion in the world, I'm sure of my compassion, and I shouldn't need to keep acting because people are giving to me. So that's, I try to write that into the book, the idea that mm. what's important is what we create in the world and what we put into the world, not what we take from it. Yeah, that's, that's so, I was, I, I read a book at the beginning of the year called The Path, um, which was this collection of Chinese philosophy explained by a modern American uh, philosopher. And one of the, those things that he introduced me to was this idea that, uh, that a Chinese philosopher called Mencius talks mm -hmm. in, incredibly about this on a very practical daily basis about how to give in a meaningful way and how it's something that we can importantly embrace in our lives from wh whichever spiritual path we're on. And so, yeah, uh, when I saw that in the book, I was thinking, hey, this is such a lovely fusion of the way. And it explains it in a way without having to ex mention the word mentious, for example, which immediately <laughs> puts off half a dozen people, as you would if you describe anything written by anyone other than Lao Tzu, apparently, these days. Yeah. So there, 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 is, there is this other theme, which I think um, that I wanted to talk to you about, which was this partly about what we're just discussing here, this, this idea of referencing uh, disciplines, spiritual disciplines, uh, but without necessarily referring to them uh, in a structural way. So, uh, I mean, I think there's a quote I've got for you written down somewhere where you say, um, here it is, here it is, nothing is holy, yet everything is sacred. And there's this idea that you, you respect and, and adhere to certain traditions, but on the other hand, I can't help feeling that underneath there is this, this, this undermining of some of the more more stru spiritual structures that are there in the world am i am i misreading again oh no not at all um <clears throat> no i am a bit of a spiritual anarchist i have to I just i'll own that one <laughs> the um oh what do i want to say this i know we got 10 minutes i'm running, <laughs> running into writer's block here um I wanted to put forward the idea that um, so many teachers, it seems more and more with every pass, I mean, the head of the Naropa school just, just got nailed on, on sex charges. And you see this more and more where people in spiritual people in positions of authority blow their authority by giving into base needs. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that's going to pollute the traditions. I mean, let's mm -hmm. face it. Buddha said that uh, Buddhism would last a thousand years, 500 if they allowed women into the Sangha, and we're 2,600 years past that. So there is some question as to whether or not the teachings are still um, pure. And the more and more I see teachers fail like this. But I do also believe that every insight that you find in Lazu, Xuanzu, uh, Menikis, uh, any of them, was an insight that somebody, an ordinary person gained by simply looking at the world. And I think that in that sense, all of us have the tools to simply be aware and look at the world and derive our own wisdom from it, not seek the wisdom of others who in some cases may be spiritually bankrupt and just have a good marketing team. <laughs> well, Yes, let's let's take it from there. Then let's say that that's what we should be doing. We should be just uh, looking for inspiration where we go uh, on the paths that we're there. So this is this is a new book. It's only just come out. It's available on paperback, in paperback, and in uh, digital format. Is that right? Yeah, it's uh, it's on Kindle. <clears throat> it's, a, it's available as a Kindle book and it's also available in paperback. Um, it's available through Amazon and it's available through my website, which you'll get a link back to my publisher. And we're offering all sorts of discounts now on the website. Um, so Excellent. people can pick okay. it up there. Yeah. Then perhaps I'll leave you with one small request 
which is to consider doing an audio version of your book. I think that would be something quite special. It is in the works. Um, I, the problem is, you know, most of what I've done, the book is professionally published. It is, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's one of the most beautiful books I've had. I'm very honored to, to hold it even. Um, being a fan of small presses, the first time that I moved away from that um, and went with a, a larger commercial situation. Do you have a copy this, in front of you there? And, and yes. Nobody. Just show it. Just show it to us a bit because I've seen it. You you've seen it, but it, I mean, it is very very beautiful, and it does contain. Could you open it a, a page or two and show some of those some of those beautiful uh, uh, photographs that appear throughout the text? It's very one. reminiscent of some of the versions. Yeah, there's one there. Yep. It is certainly a book to hold in your hand if you can. Yes, it is. Uh, it was designed. Well, my original conception of it was that you wouldn't read it straight through. That was the type of book that you would just pick up, open up to a page and start reading. Um, since it's a nonlinear text, you can jump around. You don't have to start from front to back. In that case, and then it's, it's ideal digital book because you can jump yeah. backwards and forwards without a page references. Just yep. see don't have to worry you, about it. See where you end up. But the audio is... Um, the audio is something I'm doing myself. It's not going to be done through my publisher. Um, and I'm talking with friends of mine who are professional musicians about what we need to do to set it up, to make it a professional audio. And then we've also been playing around with some ideas about adding um, uh, a soundscape to the back of it as well. Since, you know, once you get musicians involved, everybody wants to put their little piece into it. And I was resistant to that at first, but I'm going to be working, hopefully, when I go back to New York to promote the book, I'm going to be spending some time in the studio with uh, Bapa King Kare, who's a uh, percussionist and rhythm uh, bass guitarist, uh, that uh, professional in New York that I've been friends with for a couple of decades now. And we're going to see what we can come up with. And I'm actually looking forward to that collaboration because we've done some great work in the past. Excellent. We're going to look forward to listening to that as it as it manifests itself. Listen, Anthony, uh, many thanks for joining me here today. Just tell people where they can find you. Okay, www.anthonygebert, G-U-I-L-B-E-R-T dot net. And on social media, are you still hiding from that? or are you I'm still hiding there? from social media, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Twitter account under the same name. You can find me there, but I, I use it very sparingly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm anti-social media. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Fair enough. So the website's the best place to track you down, yeah? Be the website's the best place to track me down. And if I am on any social media, you'll find it linked there. Um, and as well, I mean, if you've purchased the book and read it and you want to reach out, I'm very much in, interested in hearing what people have to say about it because it is one of the most unique experiences I've had writing a book. And I think the book is more a product of... I feel sometimes just the conduit for it. I don't want to say it was divinely inspired, but I think it has many authors and I'm just one of them. Many thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Okay. Mind and body. Furry. Furry.